Surviving in space. What are the greatest dangers the founders of colonies on the moon and Mars will face? The founders of space colonies will have to be multi-talented people dedicated to the expansion of humanity into the solar system. They will have to accept the uncomfortable and dangerous existence they will lead. When the first colony ship lands on the moon, they will be cut off from the Earth for several days at least. The first ship on Mars will be on their own for years, as planetary alignment only allows optimal transit every 26 months. Assuming multiple automated supply ships have landed before the crew arrives, the greatest immediate risk to the founders will be an accident causing depressurization. The moon has no appreciable atmosphere, and Mars has a carbon dioxide atmosphere less than 1% as thick as that of the Earth. Atmospheric pressure can be measured on several scales but we will use metric in our training exclusively with conversions to help Americans who are still handicapped by the imperial system of measures. The metric system is much more useful and I really want everyone to be on the same page. Those raised in the United States will need to get familiar enough with it that conversions are not necessary to have an understanding of the importance of a measure. If I told an American that the interior temperature was 40 degrees, he would think that rather cool, assuming Fahrenheit was being used while almost anyone else in the world would know that it is a very hot temperature in Celsius. Let's create a set of numbers to memorize so we can immediately recognize when something is a problem. We have covered mass and weight in another course. Let's familiarize ourselves with important pressure and temperature numbers. We all know that zero Celsius is freezing and 100 Celsius is boiling for water under one atmosphere of pressure. Let's look at that a little more closely. Remember these are memory markers. Zero is freezing, 22.2 degrees Celsius is room temperature, but severe hypothermia for a human body, the equivalent of about 72 degrees Fahrenheit. 32 is a hot work environment, equivalent to 92 Fahrenheit and would be mild hypothermia for a patient. 37 Celsius is normal human body temperature, the equivalent of 98.6 Fahrenheit, but very hot to work in as an external temperature. 40 Celsius can be fatal over a short period of time, both for ambient temperature or the human body, as it would be 104 Fahrenheit. An internal body temperature this high can cause seizures very quickly. Working in this temperature will lead to heat stroke in a few hours. So Americans and others not used to the metric system should memorize this chart. Now when you hear a temperature in Fahrenheit, relate it to these to have an instant feel. If you have to break out a calculator, your buddy or you might be dead before you figure it out. Now let's look at pressure. Normal atmospheric pressure on Earth at sea level and 72 degrees is described as one atmosphere. This measure is used in both systems. You will also hear it described as 1013 millibars. It is usually close enough to memorize 1000 millibars. The exact numbers are sometimes important though. In metric we use pascals and 100,000 pascals is close to the 101,325 at sea level. To have an understanding of these numbers, let's look at the pressure on say a habitat door. Let's do some math. In order to relate the atmospheric pressure to human strength, we need newtons of force or pounds. One atmosphere is also described as 101,325 pascals, as pascal is newtons of force in square meters. So 101,325 newtons of force per square meter. For Americans, that is 14.7 pounds per square inch. If you go under the water on Earth a little more than 10 meters or 33 feet, you will experience two atmospheres of pressure. If you go to Denver, Colorado, you will feel 12 pounds per square inch or 81.6% the pressure at sea level. The moon is essentially a vacuum with no appreciable pressure. Mars has a pressure of 610 pascals. That is 0.6% that of Earth at sea level. It does help some though in reducing radiation and letting you have a less complicated spacesuit than in a vacuum. Let's look at that habitat door again. You are on Mars with a fellow explorer and come back to the habitat to find the airlock pressurized and your colleague lying on the floor of the airlock, half in and half out of the interior door. You don't know what has caused them to be unconscious. They are wearing their spacesuit and you can tell by the green lights on the wrist data display that it is functioning and pressurized. If you open the door, the habitat will depressurize but they will be safe in their suit. The door opens inward. Can you open that door against the normal atmospheric pressure on the inside? Let's assume it's a small door. Let's say 70 inches by 36 inches or 1.75 meters times 0.9 meters. 70 times 36 gives us 2,520 square inches times 14.7 pounds per square inch. The pressure equals 37,044 pounds of pressure on that door. If you say no problem, you are a very tough person and probably grew up on Krypton. Or you haven't done your math. In metric, that would be the equivalent of 16,838 kilograms in Earth gravity. 
you will not get that door open unless you hit it at high speed with the rover. You might have to drill a hole to depressurize the habitat. Any good habitat will have two airlocks anyway, so go around back. But what if your colleague is not in their suit? What happens to the human body in a vacuum? The movies almost always get this wrong. Let's take a closer look. Carbonated beverages always taste flat in Denver. The water boils at a lower temperature, causing your eggs to be undercooked for the same reason. Why is this? Think of the atmosphere as holding down the molecules of water that, due to their kinetic energy, are trying to escape the surface. A little of this is happening all the time, which is why water evaporates. If you want to make water boil at a higher temperature, use a pressure cooker. Cram those molecules back into the water and they need more kinetic energy or heat to escape. Go to Denver and the lower atmospheric pressure allows them to escape with less kinetic energy. The water boils at a lower temperature. What effect does this have on people? On the Earth, 78% of our atmosphere is nitrogen and only 21% is oxygen. Like carbon dioxide, nitrogen will dissolve in water under normal Earth pressure. Humans are mostly water. That means there are molecules of nitrogen gas dissolved in our bloodstream, exactly like the carbon dioxide gas dissolved in the soda. This dissolved nitrogen causes one of the greatest dangers of depressurization. Nitrogen bubbles forming in our blood, or the bins as it is known. These bubbles can block blood flow and cause heart attacks and stroke. The treatment is rapid repressurization as soon as possible. A human could survive a brief period of time without atmospheric pressure, but there would be injury and severe pain. The air would expand in the lungs explosively and escape through the mouth and nose or cause barrel trauma to them. The water on the eyes would start to instantly evaporate, causing them to dry out, as would mucous membranes in the mouth and nose. Bubbles of nitrogen would start to form in arteries and veins. Every spacesuit for colonists should have a strong inflatable pressurization cocoon that you can climb into if you have an uncontrolled pressure leak or be placed in if your colleagues find you unconscious from a suit leak. Suit leaks will be a constant danger to the early colonists. Everyone will carry duct tape to rapidly patch a hole they can find, but a small leak in your equipment or in a location that you can't reach could be fatal. Hopefully in that case you would have time to get into your cocoon and call for help. Your colleagues can then carry you inside a rover or habitat and return you to normal atmospheric pressure. If you found yourself in a rapid depressurization event, it would be natural to try to hold your breath. This instinctual reflex would not be good for you in space. You would suffer immediate injury to your lungs and eardrum. The gas in your intestinal tract will also try to escape. I'll let you picture that. It would be important to exhale as much air as possible and keep your mouth open during depressurization to try to prevent severe injury to the lungs and eardrum. This would be excruciatingly painful and you would be unable to hear well until they healed. Why not live in a low pressure, oxygen only environment like the Apollo astronauts did on their way to the moon? American spacesuits are pressurized at only 4.3 pounds per square inch, or 26,639 pascals. This makes it easier to move and is possible because 100% oxygen at low pressure gives the same oxygen delivery to your tissues as 21% oxygen at normal earth pressure. It would be possible for humans for a short while, but plants need nitrogen in the air to survive. Bacteria that are symbiotic to the plants live on the roots and remove nitrogen from the air for the plants to use. You could have nitrogenated air in the greenhouse and low pressure oxygen only in the habitat, but that would require two separate life support systems. And you would have to wear a suit in the greenhouse to prevent nitrogen from dissolving in your bloodstream. Why can't we get away with using oxygen only, especially since only 21% of normal Earth atmosphere is oxygen? After the fire that destroyed Apollo 1 and killed the crew, all the Apollo missions started in a normal Earth atmosphere when the hatch was closed. Then the capsule was brought to a 60% oxygen, 40% nitrogen mix. On the way to the moon, the nitrogen was bled off and the capsule had a 100% oxygen, low pressure atmosphere. But too much oxygen can be very damaging to human tissue, so this was okay for short duration missions, but would cause severe health problems such as fluid buildup in the lungs, chest pain, and decreased oxygen absorption over time. The International Space Station uses a mixed gas environment at normal sea level pressure. You will need to have a nitrogen oxygen atmosphere in your colony on the moon or Mars. One thing they don't show in many movies is that while Russian spacesuits are at normal atmospheric pressure, American spacesuits use a lower pressure and removing your helmet in the airlock after repressurizing it to full earth pressure in the ISS would be very difficult until you equilibrate the pressure in your suit. Also, the astronauts using American suits have to breathe pure oxygen long enough to get all the nitrogen out of their system so they can wear the low pressure suits without nitrogen related decompression symptoms. By the way, nitrogen Nitrogen dissolved in the blood under high pressure can cause nitrogen narcosis, a drug state that can occur to divers deep underwater breathing a nitrogen mixed atmosphere. That is why sometimes they breathe helium and oxygen making their voices sound funny. The increased pressure causes more gas to dissolve in the liquid of your blood. The lower the pressure becomes, the more gas bubbles form and the greater the danger of injury. 
Walking out of a habitat on the moon or Mars with insufficient pressure from your spacesuit will be a huge danger. Another thing they get wrong in movies is that space is cold everywhere. The average temperature of interstellar space is 4 Kelvin. This is minus 269 Celsius, or minus 452 Fahrenheit. That is very cold. That is not, however, the average temperature of space at the orbit of the Earth and Moon. Counterintuitively, being cold is actually less of a problem than overheating. The average temperature of space near the Earth is 283 Kelvin, which is 10 Celsius or 50 Fahrenheit. That doesn't sound too bad, but averaging can be deceiving. If 100 people are in a room and one of them is Jeff Bezos, the average income of that group will be very high, even if the other 99 are flat broke. The temperature in space, or on the moon in sunlight, can be as high as 127 Celsius, or 260 Fahrenheit, in direct sunlight, down to minus 173 or negative 280 Fahrenheit in darkness. Your spacesuit has to adjust rapidly to these extremes. Because a human being in space is surrounded by vacuum, there is nothing to carry the heat generated by their body away. Spaceships need large radiator fins to get rid of excess heat. You can see these on the ISS, and they are often mistaken for solar panels. Many spacesuits use an active cooling system that pumps heat outside the suit. The Apollo suits used a three-layer liquid cooling and ventilation garment with plastic tubing that circulated water around the astronaut, then to a sublimator, a device that used sublimating ice to cool down the water and get rid of excess heat. Suits on Mars will also have to use active cooling to keep the colonists safe outside a habitat. The Apollo suits used a pressurized internal suit environment to protect the astronauts from pressure changes. Mars suits may use constricting fabrics for the same purpose with less risk of suit leaks. Until these can be perfected, a leak in a pressure suit will be a huge risk to colonists working hard in the open on Mars. These issues are critical to the survival and success of any colonization attempt. Let's look at the problems that must be addressed, evaluate the only moon-tested suit humans have made, and then evaluate what is being designed now. A spacesuit for extravehicular activities in space will be very different from one used on the Moon and Mars for early colonists working to construct habitats. There are three ways heat can be transferred from the environment to an explorer. The first is by radiation, and this is how open space, without hardly any gas molecules at all, can still transmit heat. The sun's photons strike the astronaut and heat up his suit. This is why suits for EVA around Earth are white, to reflect as many photons as possible. Near Mercury, they will probably look like chrome, and near Pluto, they'll be dark blue or black to absorb as much heat as possible. The sun's light reflecting off the surface is important too. Light bouncing off the Earth or the Moon can transfer a lot of heat energy also. All lunar excursions during Apollo were planned at dawn. So the first heat transfer method is radiation, and we use reflection as our primary protection from it. The second method of heat transfer is by conduction. This means from contact. The astronauts on the moon could have received some heat from the lunar surface, but their boots were well insulated. When astronauts on an EVA at the ISS hold onto a handle, heat from the station is transferred to their glove and has to be dealt with. This is conduction. The third method of heat transfer is convection. When a gas is heated and comes in contact with something, it transfers kinetic or heat energy to the object. This is not a factor on the moon or in open space, but will be an issue on Mars where the thin atmosphere is able to transfer heat to an explorer or carry it away. Suits made for Mars will be very different from those made for the moon. Let's look at what these suits need to be able to do, how these problems have been solved in the past, and how we can do a better job in the future. There are seven major design parameters we must consider as we choose an existing suit or build a new one. The table you see shows these considerations, and we will carefully consider the Apollo suit. The seven factors that must be considered when designing a suit are the thermal changes it will experience, radiation, necessary oxygen supply, carbon dioxide removal system, impact resistance, abrasion resistance, and pressure support. Mass is also an issue. The Apollo Extravehicular Mobility Unit, or EMU spacesuit, were made up of a pressure suit assembly called the PSA and a portable life support system, PLSS, usually called the backpack. The A7L was used in the Apollo 7 through 14 missions, while Apollo 15 to 17 used the A7LB. For Skylab, an umbilical was used for life support instead of a backpack. The umbilical is called the Astronaut Life Support Assembly. After a lot of design redesigned from multiple contractors, the order was finally given to a company called ILC Dover, and they were able to supply these suits. The suits were tested by Apollo 9 during a spacewalk before being used on the moon by Apollo 11. A spacesuit is actually a complicated personalized spaceship. 
has to keep you alive in a very hostile environment. Often in films, you see people throwing on a spacesuit and opening the hatch to head out. It does not work this way. So the only suits tested and proven on a potential colony site are the Apollo spacesuits. EVA suits used in the space shuttle program and today on the ISS are not suitable for walking around on a moon or planet. So let's take a close look at how NASA was able to accomplish their goal with a failure rate of zero. These suits were a five layer design made of synthetic and natural rubber with flexible joints at the shoulders, elbows, wrist, hips, ankles, and knees. There were quick disconnects at the neck and forearm. They used a fishbowl or transparent spherical helmet. The first layer an astronaut put on was a constant wear garment if they were staying in the vehicle. This is basically modified thermal underwear. The first layer of the suit for extravehicular activity is the liquid cooling garment, or for Apollo, the lunar cooling and ventilation garment. A mesh garment allowing air circulation with tubing to circulate water around the astronaut and through a sublimator. A simple form of ice-based heat removal to provide temperature control. Ice doesn't melt in the vacuum of space, by the way. It sublimates like dry ice or frozen carbon dioxide does in atmosphere. It goes straight from solid to gas without going through the liquid phase. The sublimator had a metal plate with microscopic pores sized so that if water flowing under the plate was too warm, frozen water in the plate would thaw, flow through the pores in the plate, and turn to gas, carrying away the excess heat. If the circulating water was too cold, the water in the plate would freeze and make a good insulator to retain the heat. This is a brilliant design with no moving parts or sensors necessary. The second section is the pressure garment assembly. It is a two-layer rubber garment that pressurizes to provide proper force against the astronaut's skin. This protects the body from the low pressure environment. The third layer is a torso limb suit, which has attachments for gloves and boots and pushes back against the pressurized pressure garment assembly. It had variants for EVA, lunar excursion, and lunar rover use. For an EVA, walking is not a concern like it is for lunar excursions. For lunar rover use, the astronaut has to be able to sit. The fourth layer is the integrated thermal micrometeoroid garment. This covered the torso limb suit assembly and protected the suit from abrasion, solar radiation, and of course, micrometeoroids. This ITMG itself had 13 layers. From internal to external, there was rubber-coated nylon, five layers of aluminized mylar, four layers of non-woven Dacron, two layers of aluminized Kapton film, and finally, Teflon-coated beta filament cloth. The ITMG also used a patch of silver-colored woven nickel chrome wire for abrasion protection from the portable life support system or backpack. This wire mesh was also used on the upper layer of the boots and gloves as well as the knees, waist, and shoulders for added protection. Over all these layers was a fireproof covering. There were six life support connections and two parallel rows on the chest for the A7L. The lower four were for oxygen to enter and leave the suit. The upper right was electrical and biomedical sensor wiring. The upper left was for bi-directional water cooling line. The A7LB moved these connectors to two triangles, one on each side. The portable life support system or backpack would be put on. Attached to the backpack and worn on the chest was a display and control unit with a camera. The backpack had two main sections, an oxygen purge system or OPS on top and the portable life support system or PLSS below. On top was an antenna for radio communications, a locking mechanism to lock it to the back of the astronaut suit, an oxygen hose, actuator mechanism, main power switch, oxygen bottles, heater, and battery. On the lower section was a sublimator, lithium hydroxide canister reservoir for removing carbon dioxide, hard point mounts, terminal boxes, fan, a vent flow sensor, a pump, primary oxygen supply bottles, another battery, an oxygen fill connector, a drain connector, an oxygen regulator, a vent connector, sight glass, and a water fill connector. The helmet assembly had small energy bars carried in special pouches beneath the interior suit helmet rim as well as collar bags of drinking water beneath the outer suit. Now you can see how the Apollo astronauts were able to survive on the moon, but understand that these suits are not adequate for colonists working long hours on the moon or Mars. These Apollo suits only had to last a few days of activity on the moon that was limited to lunar dawn to avoid overheating issues. Even then, the abrasive moon dust, which has not been worn down by wind and friction, caused severe corrosion of the suit joints and materials. It has been argued that just a few more days of use would have caused a seal failure. What happens when an astronaut's life support system fails? There is usually a small emergency oxygen system that lasts about half an hour. If someone can get to them in time, you can link the suits and keep your buddy alive. This was a contingency for Apollo that thankfully never had to be tested. SpaceX, Boeing, and NASA are all updating their suits for Mars. 
Some of the designs hope to use constrictive fabrics rather than pressure suits to provide a safe pressure against the skin of the astronauts. There are many advanced cooling systems being designed and I would not be surprised to see the Tesla Model 3 engine cooling system technology modified and used for SpaceX crew on the moon or Mars. The materials available today for thermal protection and puncture resistance are much more advanced and lightweight compared to what the Apollo designers had to work with. The workers on the moon and Mars will need suits that can be worn day after day for 8 to 10 hour shifts. It may be necessary to use electrostatic fields to remove the moon dust from the suits prior to entering the airlock, or to use suits that you can climb into from the back so the suit never actually enters the habitat. The back of the suit would dock to the habitat and the astronaut would climb in and out to go out onto the surface. I personally believe there should be one person construction vehicles landed with the supplies to provide added safety and allow the colonists to work more efficiently. They can navigate in these small rovers and insert themselves into the upper torso of a complete suit for fine manipulation. Otherwise they can use mechanical arms and dozer blades or buckets to move materials and build the colony. They will still wear a lighter emergency pressure suit with an emergency oxygen supply in case the rover suffers depressurization. You can see my proposed design here. They can even have a soft plastic inflatable helmet attached for quick deployment in case of emergency. These rovers will also provide some radiation and micrometeoroid protection and greatly extend the founder's ability to work. I hope this course helps you understand some of the dangers of space colonization and the complexity of spacesuit design. This course was created by the Terran Space Academy to prepare you for a future in the space industry. Let me know what you think, and thanks for listening.